right, so we'll go ahead and move on to our next speaker. I have the honor and privilege of introducing Dr. Carlin Center. She's a professor and the director of our primary care sports medicine group and also the co-director of our sports concussion program. Uh, Dr. Center uh, completed her undergrad degree at Harvard where she rode Radcliffe Crew and then earned her medical degree at UCLA. She trained in internal medicine at the University of Washington and then did a primary care sports medicine fellowship at UCLA. Um, Dr. Center has been a longtime mentor of mine. She's a big uh, educator, which is the focus of her research. So she's really focused on um, trying to educate primary care physicians and has a lot of leadership in the American College of Physicians as well. She's going to be talking about the top practice changing musculoskeletal papers for primary care physicians in 2022. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Carlin Center. Uh, good morning again. It's uh, really great to be here. Thanks, Nick, for the introduction. Um, I love being at this conference, and I'm so glad to be here with you, both uh, live and uh, virtually this morning. Uh, please do submit your questions for those of you watching virtually. Uh, this talk, I think I called it the top five papers, but as these things go, as I got into preparing for this talk, I couldn't choose just five. So there will be a few extra uh, bonus papers that I, I selected. Um, at the end of the session, you'll know the new items included in the 2019 pre-participation physical exam. This is the recommended sports physical that we all do when we're seeing student athletes. You'll know what kind of activity is useful for an adolescent with sports concussion, whether surgery or physical therapy will help a college athlete with lumbar disc herniation return to play more quickly, the best pharmacologic treatment for acute musculoskeletal pain, whether surgery or physical therapy benefits patients with degenerative meniscus tears in the long run, the essential non-operative treatments for patients with hip osteoarthritis, and the keys to the exercise prescription in 2022. All right, so away we go. So first question. Also, I put in a bunch of questions um, for the audience, and I, I think these will also be um, launched on Zoom. Um, this is a little bit of a test for us, but um, maybe uh, Lauren and Nick, if, if you can give me a thumbs up or a thumbs down. Um, we may have some questions for the Zoom audience, um, but if we don't, that's okay. For the Zoom audience, if you don't see the poll turn up, um, just have your pen and paper ready, and I think it's helpful to really try to commit to an answer. I'll ask you a few multiple choice questions as we go. And for the audience here, um, I'll ask people to just show of hands what you think. So we'll start with this one. With the latest pre-participation physical exam, which of the following is included? So screening for depression and anxiety, space to identify one's gender, recognition of the male athlete triad, recommendation that the exam occur uh, in the primary medical home for the patient, inclusion of the COVID-19 vaccine conversation, or all of the above. Uh, so show of hands in the audience, A, B, C, the male athlete triad, D, E, or F. A lot of, a lot of interest in F and I imagine virtually as well. So you are correct. Uh, the 2019 and updated in 2021 PPE does include all of those things, which I'll highlight here. So, and you can find the PPE online, but um, important that the student athlete complete this with their parent uh, if they're under 18 so that we get a complete history. This new PPE form does allow the student athlete to identify their gender and then it also importantly includes screening for anxiety and depression. I mentioned the PPE from 2019 for the first time includes recognition not only of the female athlete triad, which we talked about yesterday, but also the male athlete triad. So female athlete triad, as you may remember, comes up when we're talking about you know, stress fractures in sports medicine clinic um, and is also looked for on our PPE when we ask our um, female student athletes about amenorrhea. Uh, also important to recognize that this is a phenomenon in male athletes. So the male athlete triad has to do with low, bo low bone density, energy deficiency, whether or not it's an uh, eating disorder, but some kind of low energy availability, and then functional hypogonadotropic hypogonadism. So screening both women and men 
for the triad. The 2019 PPE also emphasizes the importance of the medical home and says that the PPE serves as an entry point to the healthcare system and it's important for all of our student athletes to establish their PCP. Because the PCP can incorporate routine preventative healthcare into the sports physical and also because the history is the most important part of the PPE and we know that PCPs know this best. The history detects up to 88% of general medical conditions, detects 67 to 75% of musculoskeletal conditions. And so that's why the importance of trying to provide the athlete with this form ahead of time, asking them to complete it with their parent so we get a really robust history. What about vaccines? So the PPE offers us an opportunity to start a conversation about vaccines helpful for us as providers to identify our vaccine resources ahead of time. So if, so if your patient is motivated to have a vaccine, you know you can administer it, or you know exactly where to send them and where they can complete the series. And good to use the PPE as an opportunity to identify and record your student athlete's history of COVID-19 infections and treatment and severity, as well as their COVID-19 vaccination status. So why is it important you know, to have a vaccine conversation in the middle of a sports physical? First, we know that a local approach is important because we trust the people with whom we've had longitudinal relationships. So again, emphasizing the, the value of all of our student athletes having a medical home and identifying a PCP. Also, the sports physical offers an opportunity for us to reach young people who might not otherwise seek care. And so it's a great opportunity to have this conversation. And then good to be aware, I think as we all know, that this can be a sensitive topic and some may not be ready to discuss this and some may feel shameful about hesitancy. So to bring, uh, to acknowledge that it's a vulnerable, it can be a vulnerable place for people. What about post-vaccine recommendations? So we, rec we recommend uh, patients consider a reduced training load for 48 to 72 hours post-vaccine, especially after the second dose. These are recommendations particularly around um, the COVID-19 vaccine, but uh, you could consider discussing uh, with any patient around any vaccine. For example, when I have a patient in my primary care clinic who's getting a Tdap, I always recommend that they not do upper body strengthening for a couple days until the, you know, until the soreness goes down. Um, and then the athlete, you know, should be aware that they are fully vaccinated two weeks after the completed vaccine. All right, next case. So this is a 15 year old high school student athlete with no past medical history who presents five days after a concussion so suffered during a soccer game. The main symptoms are headache and dizziness. Which of the following will expedite their recovery? So I'll read the options and then I'll ask for a show of hands. A, rest from all physical activity until concussion symptoms resolve. B, begin progressive stretching that does not significantly elevate the heart rate. Or C, begin a progressive aerobic exercise program as tolerated by symptoms for at least 20 minutes per day. All right, so audience, I hope you're ready to commit. Um, some of you may have prepared for this by attending Dr. Hadamia's talk uh, moments ago. So anyone in the audience for A, uh, rest until better, okay, or B, um, start a stretching program, or C, begin a progressive aerobic exercise program. Okay, so a lot of interest in the room about C. I would agree with C, um, and this brings us to our second practice changing paper. This from 2021 from Dr. Letty's group in Buffalo about early aerobic exercise versus stretching. So this is the latest publication on this topic. Adolescents presenting within 10 days of sport-related concussion um, at their concussion visit were given a physical exam and the Buffalo concussion treadmill test, which is not unlike a Bruce treadmill test you might run your patient through for, uh, in the cardiology clinic, uh, but rather than looking for uh, ischemia of the heart, you're looking for exacerbation of concussion symptoms. So they do a physical exam and a BCTT at their concussion visit, and then they're randomly assigned into a group that gets sub-symptom threshold aerobic exercise at 90% of their target heart rate identified by the BCTT, at least 20 minutes a day 
for up to four weeks post-injury. Or they stretch 20 minutes daily for up to four weeks post-injury. The primary outcome was recovery within the four-week intervention period. They randomized 118 adolescents. On average, these patients were 15 years old. 60% were male, 40% were female. The average time since injury, and I think this is really important for our practice, was five to six days post-injury. So they're exercising these athletes quite acutely and in the midst of symptoms. The median days to recovery in the aerobic exercise group was 14 days and in the stretching group was 19 days. Those who were symptomatic still at four weeks, the aerobic group 21% and the stretching group 32%. There were no adverse events in either group. So reassuringly, even though these were student athletes who had symptoms and were only five, on average five to six days post-injury, no adverse events. The exercise group recovered more quickly and had a lower risk of persistent symptoms. I would say the limitation of applying this study to my practice is that I don't do the BCTT for all of my patients. So, you know, it's a little bit, uh, what I do is more art than science compared to Dr. Letty. But I, will I do use this data to encourage my, my student athletes to start a, a low-grade cardiovascular exercise program as long as it does not make their symptoms worse and progress from there. Sometimes if a student athlete's having um, a lot of symptoms or has trouble with that, their athletic trainer at school may be able to guide them if they're lucky to have one, or a physical therapist uh, can help them. All right, case number two. This is a 19-year-old male college athlete who comes with three months of gradually worsening right-sided low back pain and lumbar radiculopathy without weakness. You diagnose him with a lumbar disc herniation. His goal is to return to the same level of sport as soon as possible. What do you recommend? A, so again, I'm gonna ask you in the audience, so be, be prepared. Um, but I'll read the, the options first. So do you provide education, physical therapy, and non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications if he can tolerate? Or B, would you, do, would you refer for a lumbar discectomy? All right, so anyone in the audience for A? Okay, so for those watching online, we probably have about 80% of the audience voting for A. Anyone in the audience say uh, for B? Not a lot of interest, okay. Um, Maybe there aren't any spine surgeons here, I don't know. Uh, so what about this? What do we know about this? This is practice changing paper number three. This was a systematic review and meta-analysis looking at 20 studies um, that included return to play after lumbar disc herniation in athletes. This included 1,000 patients. On average, the age was 28 years. Largely men, so 98% men. The most frequent sports were football, basketball, baseball, hockey, 800 patients in the surgery group and 300 in the non-operative group. What did they find? Between the two groups, surgery and non-operative, on return to play, no significant difference between the groups. 83% returned to play in the operative group, 82% in the non-operative group. What about time to return to play? 5.2 months in the operative group, 4.11 months in the non-operative group. So I think uh, limitation, uh, no randomized controlled trials were included, and it was difficult to standardize return to play across sports, and only 1.8% of those included were women. So I think what's the take home? In your, in your student athlete with a lumbar disc herniation, this large, um, this paper, which includes 1,000 student athletes, uh, would indicate that non-operative treatment will uh, be uh, the way to go. Will return the athlete to will safely return the athlete to play as fast as possible. All right, case number three. So this puts you in an urgent care setting. So imagine you are in, in you are in an urgent care setting. And you're seeing a 40-year-old man who comes in with really bad pain. So his pain is 7 out of 10 on the right lateral knee because he basically ran into a low table. <laughs> and it is really hurting him. So you're evaluating his knee, and you want to provide him some pain relief. And which of the following would you give him to help relieve pain? And assume he has no past medical history and no allergies. 
All right, so this is kind of a laundry list of medicines. So my question is, you know, what's your go-to here? And, and, um, and I'm interested to see like what you would choose. Um, let's take a look at these. I'm not gonna read them because I think it's actually easier for you to read them in your head and think, okay, which one of these, if I'm seeing this 40 year old, otherwise healthy person, like which of these meds would I give this person acutely to best control his pain? Okay. All right, so I'm gonna read them off and I'll ask the audience uh, to respond. So who would give A? So 400 milligrams of ibuprofen and 1,000 of, of acetaminophen. Okay, so in, for those at home, we have, I'm gonna call it 10% saying A. B, 800 of ibuprofen and 1,000 of acetaminophen. Okay, I'm gonna say that's about half of the group here is gonna go with B. C, 30 milligrams of codeine and 300 milligrams of acetaminophen. For those at home, people in the audience are not a big fan of codeine. <laughs> All right. Um, D, five milligrams of hydrocodone and 300 milligrams of acetaminophen. Okay, in the here in person, zero, zero people want to prescribe this one. And then E, five milligrams of oxycodone and 325 of acetaminophen. Okay, and for those at home, no one in the audience is recommending E. So what do we know about this? Um, this is, I think, a really, a really neat paper as well. So this was a paper looking at oral analgesics for acute musculoskeletal pain in the emergency department. They evaluated these same five oral analgesic plans and measured pain before the medicine was given and an hour post-medication on a 10-point scale. The patients were 21 to 64 years old with pain of less than seven days duration involving one or more extremity, distal to and including the shoulder and hip. So this did not include spine is basically what they're saying. Patients were randomly assigned to one of those five groups. They enrolled 600 patients, majority male Latino, no difference in efficacy of the opioid and non-opioid combination analgesics. So again, um, and I think, I think you knew that. <laughs> um, there was no difference in efficacy of the opioid and non-opioid combination analgesics. Now, I think this, this is not new news for all of us in primary care. I think we understand that uh, opioids are, are, you know, tend, unfortunately, do not do a great deal for musculoskeletal pain compared to Tylenol and, uh, and NSAIDs. So as you did, I think prescribing uh, some combination of acetaminophen and a non steroidal anti-inflammatory uh, is, is a good approach for this patient. Um, the, but I think it, kind of the thing that, caught my eye about this paper is the next point, which is that when you look at these patients, they actually, when you look at them individually, the author said, you know, each of these patients actually had a very wide variability of response to the drug. Uh, so even though on average, uh, there wasn't really an, improve, uh, an improvement one regimen compared to the other, um, many patients didn't actually get adequate analgesia from any of these options. So even though on a whole, the whole cohort cohort did improve. If you look at individuals, many of them didn't. So I think what that means to me is circle back, you know, to your patient acutely with, with whatever acute regimen you've provided and make sure they're responding and if not to change. Also, of course, those prescribed opioids had a higher rate of nausea, nausea and vomiting. Uh, so no, so so good, thank you. <laughs> okay, so what, going back to the multiple choice question, the answer was there was no difference between um, A, B compared to the opioid ones, and of A and B, they were similar. All right, case number four. This is a 65-year-old person who presents with three months of medial knee pain. Uh, they have swelling and instability and no frank locking. The pain is worse with weight bearing, better with rest, ice, and NSAIDs. On exam, they have neutral knee alignment when standing, tender medial joint line, medial femoral condyle, and medial tibial plateau, a small effusion. Range of motion is zero to 120 and limited by pain. They have mild crepitus, a positive medial McMurray, medial knee pain with squat, and no ligamentous laxity. 
The patient asks you what the best treatment plan is to help their symptoms now as well as in the long term. What do you recommend? So I'll read these and I'll ask you to vote. A, physical therapy. B, refer for arthroscopic partial menisectomy. Or C, refer for total knee arthroplasty. And I'll go back to the case. So 65-year-old person, three months of medial knee pain. This is their physical exam. They want to know what's going to help them now and in the long term. OK. So with a show of hands, um, those who would recommend physical therapy. All right, so that's about probably 80% of the audience. Um, a show of hands for refer for arthroscopic partial menisectomy. So, uh, probably, let's call it 10% of the audience. And then refer for total knee arthroplasty. OK, and 0% of the audience. All right, so in this case, let's look, let's look at the case in detail. Here on this slide, I've highlighted in royal blue the factors that are consistent with a diagnosis of knee osteoarthritis. So the patient's age, older than 55 years old, increases your risk of knee osteoarthritis. Bony tenderness increases the likelihood this is osteoarthritis. And effusion and crepitus, all factors that increase the likelihood that this patient has knee osteoarthritis. In navy blue, I've highlighted the physical exam findings consistent with a meniscus tear. So the patient has a tender medial joint line, a medial positive medial McMurray, and medial knee, knee pain with squat. So this patient has both medial compartment osteoarthritis and a medial meniscus tear. And this is the paper. So this is uh, this this um, there's a series of papers that I think you're I'm sure you're familiar with. Um, if you weren't before this conference, you are after yesterday, of patients who've been randomized to arthroscopic partial menisectomy versus physical therapy. These are patients who have um, some degree of osteoarthritis and a degenerative meniscus tear. And the question is, what is the best thing for these patients? We know from the initial studies of this cohort of patients that acutely physical therapy is the way to go for the majority of these patients. So the majority of our patients who come in if, if this patient's question were, what's going to help me in the, one, in the next year, physical therapy most of the time. And this patient wants to know, but what's going to help me in the long term? And that's what this paper answered. So they looked at 320 patients aged 45 to 70 years with a degenerative meniscus tear and randomly assigned 16 sessions of PT or, or an intervention of the arthroscopic partial meniscectomy. And the primary outcome was knee function. The secondary outcome was progression and knee OA on, our, on radiographs. So they not only looked at function, but they also looked at what's the likelihood this patient's going to get arthritis, whether they do meniscectomy or PT. Amazingly, they had 87% of their patients do follow up at five years. And they found between these two groups, there was no difference in knee function between the group that did physical therapy versus arthroscopic partial meniscectomy. And there was no difference in the severity of knee OA between the two groups. So the group that went to physical therapy did the same as the group that had arthroscopic partial metastectomy even five years later. And so this reinforces that in the short and the long term, long term being five year follow up, physical therapy is the right first step. Always with the asterisks that in this cohort of patients, there is a 30% crossover for, for patients who start being randomized in the PT group and they actually then don't get better and they choose to, to go into the arthroscopic partial meniscectomy group. And so that always reminds me in the back of my head to make sure that I follow up with these patients that I've referred to PT and make sure they're improving. And those who are not improving, because probably three out of 10 are not, refer for surgery. Incidentally, that, that subgroup is being studied now by the same group. So I think in future years we'll have more um, data to present about how we identify like that three out of 10, who are those three out of 10 patients and what can we do to either improve their physical therapy uh, prescription? Is there something, you know, we can improve about what they're doing in PT or is there something about their injury that really does require arthroscopic, sur arthroscopic surgery? So more on that. 
All right, case number five. Uh, this is a 69-year-old woman who comes in with right hip pain. Her pain's worse when she's trying to put shoes on, sitting, and driving. It's better if she takes ibuprofen. It started a year ago and is slowly getting worse. She's noticed that the right hip isn't as flexible as the left hip in yoga. On exam, she has a mildly antalgic gait, mild tenderness of the right inguinal canal. Her left hip flexion is 130. She can internally rotate to 40 and externally rotate to 60, while her right hip flexion is limited to 100 due to groin pain. External rotation to 30 and internal rotation is limited to 10, also due to groin pain. So which of the following is a strongly recommended treatment for hip osteoarthritis? So I'll let you read these for a moment, and then I'll ask you to vote. So consider these options. Think about your clinic. Which of these would you recommend for this patient? All right, so a show of hands. So all of those, um, those of you who'd say weight loss or self-management, education programs, physical exercise, Tai Chi, or all of the above. Yes. Uh, so all of the above. And uh, this, this, I think, is also a, really a foundational practice-changing paper published in JAMA in 2021. And apologies that the graphic is small, but I'll highlight the take-homes for you. So what this graph is showing is columns of expert opinion about how to manage both knee and hip osteoarthritis non-operatively. And so across the top, we see recommendations from American College of Rheumatology and um, American Academy of Orthopedic Surgery, as well as a couple other arthritis expert consensus groups. And then down the left-hand column, we see different interventions. Where I've put a blue star are things you know, where the dots are green, which means the evidence is they're strongly recommended. So what are these things? These things are weight loss, self-management and education programs, physical activity, Tai Chi, um, and then, uh, which we'll talk about in detail in a moment, I want to spend a minute and just talk about the pharmacologic treatments that are highlighted here. So you can see oral NSAIDs and topical NSAIDs both have a lot of evidence and are strongly recommended. Interestingly, acetaminophen is the third row down, and so you can see that actually has just yellow and orange, meaning uh, conditionally recommended and conditionally recommended against. So used to be that I would recommend acetaminophen first and foremost for my patients with osteoarthritis. And I've changed my practice based on this paper to now recommend for patients with knee osteoarthritis who have no contraindications, topical diclofenac gel. And for hip osteoarthritis patients who have no contraindications, some oral nonsteroidal anti-inflammatory drug. There's not enough evidence for topical NSAID for hip osteoarthritis, probably because it's such a deep joint. Um, also, I'll highlight at the bottom, you can see glucose, uh, glucocorticosteroid injection uh, still with uh, green dots. And in this paper, the other kinds of injections uh, were felt not to be recommended. Um, and I think that's a really interesting, fast-moving part of sports medicine where when this paper gets revised, we'll sort of see if other types of injections um, have stronger evidence. I think, I think that they will. So taking a little bit of a focus on these non-pharmacologic, non-operative interventions. What are we talking, when we talk about weight management, what, what do I really mean? Um, for patients with a BMI greater than or equal to 25, we're talking about minimum 5% body weight loss leads to significant functional improvement measured by the Womax score, which is a uh, well-validated score looking at arthritis outcomes. These patients have reduced pain and, of course, health benefits way beyond osteoarthritis of the knee or hip. There's also good evidence for self-management and educational programs. I will say these programs tend to be um, resource intensive and, for me, not always attainable as a, as a PCP, but if your patient has access to an osteoarthritis program or is open to joining a group, there's good evidence that the patients benefit from these programs where they work on um, education around the disease process, education around treatment, and goal setting. Oh, I put on the, the picture here is um, a picture of the Arthritis Foundation, and I put this just as one resource that offers 
these kinds of resources in our community for patients. And then Tai Chi, I wanted to highlight Tai Chi partly, we're um, really fortunate in San Francisco to have a lot of Tai Chi resources. And Tai Chi, uh, interestingly, has risen up in terms of quality of evidence for knee and hip osteoarthritis. This is a traditional Chinese mind-body practice that combines meditation with slow, gentle movements and diaphragmatic breathing. And it's thought that this is effective because it improves strength and balance, as well as reduces a person's risk of falls, also improves mood and self-efficacy. So I have started recommending Tai Chi to my patients who are open to that. Totally switching gears, what about surgery? What about hip replacement? What, what's the data on hip replacement? Hip replacement is highly effective for hip osteoarthritis. It does take six to 12 months to recover, but patients have excellent pain relief on post-op day one. At minimum, a hip replacement will last a patient 10 to 20 years. And there's a lot of data that says that this is an underutilized treatment in patients with severe hip OA. And so I bring this up because of the following papers. We, uh, this has been studied and shown that black patients have significantly lower rates of hip replacement than white patients. And this is not explained by a difference in prevalence of osteoarthritis between black and white patients. Black and Hispanic patients reported significantly fewer joint replacements than white patients. And it, the degree of underuse of hip replacement is, has been shown to be three times greater in women than in men. And one possible reason that was highlighted in this paper published actually in the year 2000 in the New England Journal was that it's possible women were less likely to have discussed hip replacement with their physician compared to men. So a reminder um, to include a discussion with your hip osteoarthritis patient, particularly if they have se severe hip OA. We know this is underutilized, so make sure that they're aware hip replacement's an option, if it is for them. All right. Uh, this is our last case. So this is a 65-year-old African-American woman with right knee pain due to osteoarthritis who presents for her annual physical exam. She takes no medications. She has a busy job. She's mostly on the computer. She used to walk to work, but she's less active this year because she's been working from home. You measure her manual blood pressure. It's 130 over 80. This is the first time she's ever had a high blood pressure. Her heart rate's 80. Her height is 5'3". Her weight's 170, so her BMI is 30. Her labs, her A1C is 6.3, her total cholesterol is 192, triglycerides are 119, HDL is 50, and LDL is 118, her TSH is normal, and her ASCVD risk that you calculate is 8% based on this data. She asks you what you would recommend to help reduce the knee pain and prevent her from having a stroke or heart attack. So what would you recommend? So I'll read these. And, um, and then ask for a show of hands. So physical activity, a statin medication, an antihypertensive, knee replacement surgery, or bariatric surgery. We'll go back to the case, just so you can kind of take in all that data and think about this patient in your office for their annual visit. Okay, so with a show of hands, uh, physical activity, everyone who would recommend physical activity as the main intervention. So for those at home, we're going to say 60%. Those who would recommend a statin, those who would, so for those at home, that was not, I don't think anyone wants to start a statin. Um, antihypertensive, a little bit of interest for antihypertensive, knee replacement surgery, and bariatric surgery. Okay, so majority of the audience would recommend physical activity, um, and I would agree with that. I think that in this patient, she's, um, Going back to the data, 65 years old, wants to have an intervention that's going to help lower her risk of stroke, heart attack, and improve her knee osteoarthritis. And looking at her data, I think um, physical activity will achieve that as well as help work on her um, other um, risk factors that you've identified in her exam. So when thinking about her physical activity prescription, the things that are really relevant to me in her history are her knee pain due to arthritis. So you wanna take that into account when you're talking to her about activity. And then also her sedentary behavior. And, and we'll talk a little bit like, what does that mean? What's, what is the fact that she, from the pandemic, has been working from home and has been more sedentary? What effect does that have on her health? 
When we talk about physical activity, we are talking about two things. We're talking about exercise, which includes the FIT principle, how to prescribe exercise, frequency, intensity, time, and type, and the four types of exercise, which I've listed here. We're also talking about avoiding sedentary behavior. And these are guidelines that are evolving, but the take home is the less sedentary, the better. When we think about physical activity and, and when we think about prescribing physical activity and when we think about the evidence for physical activity, we always talk about intensity. So we talk about low intensity, moderate intensity, and vigorous intensity activity. And, and so what does that really mean? How should we conceive of low, moderate, and vigorous? We can think about this very objectively, and that's METs. So METs are a metabolic equivalent, which is the ratio of the rate of energy expended um, during activity to the rate of energy we expend while we're sitting. So one MET is what we do when we're sitting. When we're walking, if you're walking slowly two miles an hour, that's two and a half METs. So if you're taking a walk where it takes you 30 minutes to walk a mile, that's two and a half METs. That's low intensity exercise. And there's evidence that low intensity activity lowers our risk of mortality. So low intensity exercise, 30 minutes per mile, 30 uh, yeah, minutes per mile. If we're walking three miles an hour, that's three and a half METs, that's moderate intensity exercise. So if you're kind of hustling to a meeting, you're probably walking like 100 steps a minute, that's moderate intensity physical activity. Vigorous intensity, so if you're running, say you're running a 10 minute mile, that's actually 10 METs. So that's vigorous intensity. Now that's a very objective way to measure physical activity. Um, more sort of, um, uh, or that's sort of a very absolute way, a more relative way to measure physical activity are the three areas below. So you could use heart rate. If your patient's interested in wearing a heart rate monitor and you can see the parameters there, you can use the talk test. So low intensity, you can talk and sing. Moderate intensity, you can talk but not sing. Vigorous, you can only say a few words. And then rate of perceived exertion is kind of interesting. Um, rate of perceived exertion has been studied and it's been shown that actually, like let's say you're on the treadmill and you're briskly walking and we ask you, hey, on a scale of seven to 20, how hard are you working? And you say, oh, I'm working at an 11. Turns out that that actually correlates pretty well with your heart rate. So that 11 actually correlates with a heart rate of 110. It's not perfect for every person, but rate of perceived exertion actually can be very useful. I always get excited to review the benefits of exercise. And I, I think because, you know, when you think about uh, the benefits of exercise and really look at this list of benefits, um, there's no other intervention we can, I can offer as an internist that does this, nothing. So, Exercise reduces our risk of all-cause mortality, dementia, cardiovascular disease and mortality, hypertension, type 2 diabetes, hyperlipidemia, depression, anxiety, falls, postpartum depression, and weight gain. It improves sleep, cognition, bone health, physical function, quality of life, and the ability to maintain a healthy body weight. And it reduces eight types of cancer. So again, you know, I mean, I think you know this, but there's no, you know, no medication that can do all of these things. This was a paper I wanted to include because I think this is also really an important paper and a really great contribution to the body of literature on exercise for medicine. This talks about the benefits of strength training for our patients who are 65 years and older. And it focuses on balance and muscle strengthening activities, which we're gonna call MSAs. Previous papers focused on the health benefits of MSAs all to do with fall prevention. So we know that MSAs help reduce falls. And the research question was, what is the dose response association between MSA and all cause mortality in older adults? And the re results showed that MSAs were associated with lower all cause mortality independent of cardiovascular activity. So if you have a patient who's really interested in strength training they're 65 or older, and they're wondering, like, do I need to be, do I need to do cardio? Or can I get all these, can I get health benefits from strength training? I really like strength training. Absolutely. Strength training definitely helps, helps your health, and it's been now shown to lower all-cause mortality. 
Two to six episodes a week of MSA may be optimal, and this even remains important, they showed in this paper, for our patients 85 years and older. Now, circling back to sedentary behavior, I told you that physical activity, I really think about, you know, how I'm going to prescribe exercise and also what's going on with sedentary behavior. And so what do we know about sedentary behavior? First of all, it's, just, it's defined as any waking behavior with an energy expenditure of less than or equal to 1.5 mets while in a seated, reclined, or lying position. Turns out this is a leading lifestyle risk factor for cardiovascular disease and all-cause mortality worldwide. Guidelines generally reduce, recommend reducing, minimizing sedentary behavior. We don't have any specific dosing recommendations yet. It turns out that the health risks due to high amounts of sedentary behavior can be decreased by increasing physical activity or decreasing sedentary behavior time, especially among patients who are the least physically active. So when we think about our patients coming in, it's probably not every patient who would benefit from counseling on this, and, and I don't have time for sedentary behavior counseling on all of my patients. But in this patient whose physical exam, she's presenting with um, some metabolic parameters and some interest in improving her arthritis and her lowering her risk of heart attack and stroke, her sed sedentary behavior is an opportunity to think about what can we do here? Uh, those of you who know me well know that sort of my mantra is every patient is an athlete, and this is where we get into thinking about how, how can I help, how can we help every one of our patients be an athlete with this? So how do we prescribe exercise? We want to have, ask patients to move more and to sit less. So for a patient who has a lot of sedentary behavior, to promote low-intensity physical activity. And it's been shown that low-intensity physical activity may actually be a gateway to people doing more physical activity. It helps to incorporate physical activity into daily life. Um, and once your patient's meeting low intensity physical activity goals, to circle back and encourage more. And so these graphics really talk about the recommended physical activity for all of us. We want to limit the amount of sedentary time and replace with more activity. For cardiovascular activity, at least 150 to 300 minutes a week of moderate intensity uh, aerobic activity, more is better. For additional health benefits, at least two days a week of muscle strengthening activities. And with that paper I presented, this is true for 65 and older, this is true for 85 and older. For adults 65 and older especially, we want to recommend at least three days a week doing a multi-component physical activity that emphasizes functional balance and strength training at a moderate intensity or greater. And these are activities like Zumba, like yoga, like Tai Chi. And so using the FIT principle can help you write your exercise prescription for a patient. And it has been shown that actually writing this down for a patient uh, is, is helpful, taking it as seriously as you would if you were, performing a or if you were prescribing a medication. All right, so I told you at the end we would know these seven items. Uh, I hope that these practice changing papers help you and your practice come Monday. And in the syllabus, I left some resources for you, including our sports rehab website with lots of great handouts about how to help your patients rehab. There's PDFs there and YouTube videos created by our outstanding athletic trainers to help your patients recover from sports injuries. This is my favorite resource for my uh, patients, particularly elders, as they learn about exercise and physical activity. When I have an elder patient who's interested in learning more or wants a starting program, this is where I send them. These are the videos associated with that. And our uh, UCSF Ortho YouTube page has a lot of uh, material as well for those of you interested in watching and learning more sports medicine. I really appreciate your, um, your attention and I look forward to your questions, thank you. Thanks, Dr. Center. Uh, we have a time for a couple of questions. I feel like I have to get up and exercise after that talk. So <laughs> I know. Feel free, those in the audience, feel free to stand up. It's been a little bit. Thank you, Doc. Uh, the, the, that one study that there was a crossover of 30% of patients to partial meniscectomy, um, at what point 
do they cross over after how many months of physical therapy? Yeah, great point. It's, um, I, th you know, I can't remember at what point they allowed crossover. I'm, th I think they followed up with them at six weeks. It might be that early. And it's interesting when you look at the studies, like the first study that came out of this cohort, those patients just, they don't get better until they cross over. You know, even the patients who stuck with it for like three months, they, they don't get better. And then they get the meniscectomy and their Womax improve, just like the other folks in the PT group. They have looked at that cohort so far and they've found that they're trying to define, again, like I was saying, like what is it about this subgroup? Um, and they found that this patient, these patients tend to present more acutely, so like cl more proximally to their index injury, and they tend to have higher pain scores at presentation. So when you're meeting with your patients on this, those would be things you know, to just keep in mind, like, oh, okay, this patient, their pain's kind of higher than my other patients with the same problem. Uh, they might not do as well with physical therapy. Thank you for the question. Thank you, Dr. Sensor. Um, I'm curious for the paper on like different treatments for uh, hip OA, what's your experience or what's like the data say about using BUP for patients who may not be, uh, you know, uh, adequate for surgery and, and things of that nature? Yeah, thanks for the question. So, um, so buprenorphine, you know, I have to say, I don't know that I've seen a paper and I I don't think it was specifically addressed, but I will go back and check in the GMA recommendations. I, I don't know, but it's a great question. I live in a rural area where it can take three to six months just to get into PT. So I'm wondering if there's any evidence for kind of home exercise programs, um, at least in the interim. Thank you. Yeah, uh, great question. The, yes, um, the... I think that's a limitation of, some, of the studies I've read about physical therapy for osteoarthritis, is that they're typically carried out in physical therapy offices. That being said, recently, and I can't cite them, I have seen papers about some telehealth programs um, being effective. Uh, and, and the other thing we know is effective uh, is are these self-education programs, which makes me think that the, the important part maybe and probably is frequent outreach. So, whether, and, and I don't know if the, I don't know if it's been looked at whether that outreach, does it matter the medium? Like, does it matter if it's in person versus telephone versus video? Um, yeah, so I wish I could, could give you a great reference um, for that. I will say that the physical therapy for uh, knee and hip osteoarthritis that is typically involved in the interventions um, I think is doable for patients at home. And, you know, as you know, that's, that's what patients are usually given is their home exercise program. So it wouldn't be that the problem would be uh, that the equipment would be needed. It, it, I think it has to do more with touches. So if your patient could have frequent touches, they might get the same benefit as if they were going into the office. Thanks for the question. Well, we're right at 11, so thanks Dr. Center for the great talk, and um, we'll let you guys transition to your next one.